and welcome. I'm Eric Miskell and welcome to this edition of EMS Now Up Close. Um, today I am speaking with Mike Casarino. Mike is the Principal Manufacturing Engineer with uh, Microboard. Microboard is an EMS uh, company out of Connecticut, who you will learn more about in just a moment. And they recently published a white paper called Five Step Process for Medical Design Transfer. Uh, I was able to review that. It was very interesting. And uh, so we followed up with Microboard to, to have a discussion about it. So Mike, that brings us to you. Welcome. It's a pleasure to meet you. Why don't you begin by telling us about yourself and your background? Hi, well, thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. I'm a, a, a electrical software engineer by trade. Uh, I've joined Microboard in 2021 to help them uh, along their medical device journey as a principal manufacturing engineer. Um, I have uh, 34 years of prior experience in the medical device world with Philips Medical, uh, primarily focused on R&D, manufacturing engineering, uh, with, with uh, specific disciplines in process development, test engineering, and really specializing in process validation of medical devices. Okay. And then within uh, Microboard, any comments about? Yeah, so Microboard is a, is a contract manufacturer in, in uh, Seymour, Connecticut. We make uh, primarily circuit boards for various industries, including medical device industry. And we also manufacture some medical devices for a few, few manufacturers. We actually build the, the full HLA and ship them to those, to those specific customers of ours. And we're expanding that business and thus that was the, the premise of the white paper. Okay, good. Well, well, let's talk about that. So, so tell me about why Microboard wrote this white paper. And again, it's it's entitled Five Steps to Medical Design Transfer." What was what was the impetus so, for that? So, the real the real emphasis for, for the white paper was was um, many of the the companies that reach out to Microboard, especially med, uh, medical device manufacturers, are small companies, and they're either just starting on their journey, or or they need help identifying the activities that are required to actually to transfer their design to a contract manufacturer. And, and we thought that it was important to, um, to, to help these companies and provide some guidance to them. Um, the five steps process that we use is actually the same process that I've used in my entire career, including with Phillips. And, um, and we are instituting that same process here as well. And it's, it's a really good robust process a uh, high level work stream that, that helps identify the work that needs to be done to, to actually produce the product at the contract manufacturer and end up with a, with a positive result. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ultimately the white paper um, leads to, to a medical device manufacturer contacting microboard or working with microboard, then, then it's great for both of us. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, and it provides guidance to a, to a medical device manufacturer, and they go somewhere else, and then that's a that's that's really good too, because the whole purpose of the white paper is just sharing the knowledge and experiences that we gained over all the years, and just helping everybody. No, that's very good. That's that's a good way to put it. So, why five steps? How, how did you come up with these particular five steps that you did? That's that's a good question. It, it really comes down to standardization of processes. And it's based on the years of experience of transferring products to, within organizations or to contract manufacturers. And a lot of it is really just iterating that process from lessons learned. So you, you start with one process, what you think will work. And as you do it repetitively, you, you start finding issues or and, and lessons that you learn, things that didn't go right or may not have gone as, as well as you thought it would, and you iterate it. And ultimately it comes down to where we are. Um, that's really, just an easy way to say, you know, I'm really old. I've been doing this a long time. And so figure stuff out as time goes on, you know. Um, but typically, if it, especially in project management, you know, you're breaking up your, your, your work into, into logical work streams. And each work stream has deliverables and inputs that go into it. And those work streams, deliverables may become inputs to other, other work streams as well. And in the end, or it becomes the end result. Here, here's your finished product. Yeah. Um, and it's over, over the years, we just developed that these five work streams that are the five steps are essentially the top level or the key ones. Um, you know, and it comes down to requirements definition, which is probably the most important one. 
Um, and it's really just making sure that what you, you expect is defined and that your contract manufacturer has a clear understanding of it, you know, and, and that's the ultimate goal. And then process and test development, which is where the meat and potatoes are. That's where actually all the work happens. That's where you're doing your assembly, you're doing your test, you're doing your inspection process, you're developing, you're building your first prototypes and understanding how the product goes together. And you're communicating with your customer, the, the medical device manufacturer, with any issues you identify. And you're actually helping them improve their product because you're going to find stuff in the transfer that they may not have found. Because until you start building it, you don't learn right. a lot of things. And then, of course, process validation. And just to quote the Global Harmonization Task Force and the FDA guidance, uh, that's where you verify your process is capable of consistently producing a product that meets your requirements. Mm -hmm. And then, and then lastly, you know, it's about the process control. So once you, once you have your process developed, you have your validation done, you've implemented your process in production. Now you identify the key process uh, parameters that you want to monitor. And then as your production continues on, you're, you're tracking those parameters and, and you're determining if your process remains in control and you're, you're looking at the trends and verifying if, if something starts to skew. And then you take action so that it doesn't actually trip a limit and cause a problem to your to your end customer. And so that's kind of where they came from. Okay, there's a lot there. And having read the uh, the white paper, and as I commented to you before we began here, I thought it was. I think it's very well written. It's very well kind of the 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 flow of it. It's uh, it, it's a very good white paper. So, but. There's a lot to it, and it, you know, you just simplified five, you know, five very critical steps. Um, what is the most critical thing that the medical design, medical device designer needs to keep in mind when they're doing a design transfer to a contract manufacturer? I think the most important thing is is the requirements, okay. and, and the reason why I say that some people will think, well, why are the requirements so important? because there's so many other things you, you you know you do want to make sure you select the right supplier you want to make sure it's a right fit and a relationship mm -hmm. between the two but no matter what supplier you go to you can have the right supplier but if you don't have the right requirements defined or all your requirements defined and then that, that supplier doesn't have a clear understanding of what those requirements are what's going to happen is you're going to end up with something that you don't want mm -hmm. or it may not meet all your all, all everything that you thought it was going to mm -hmm. going to meet um and so, you know, that's the ultimate goal is making sure that, that your, your product is built to your requirements. It performs as you expect it and it meets all your specifications and then both sides are happy. Um, in, in a lot of times, medical device manufacturers don't define all the requirements and then you end up with a situation where it could be as bad as where they wanted an apple and you gave them an orange, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, you know, and, and a lot of it comes from lessons learned. So, I, you know, I have to admit, you know, historically, we've had a lot of things, especially in one of my very first transfers, you know, when you're when you're a medical device designer and manufacturer, especially, you know, 20, 30 years ago, everything was integrated in house, you did everything you designed it, you built it, and then you shipped it to the customer. So there's a lot of knowledge that's in the in in that facility, you know how to do it, kind of thing, right? So your requirements aren't fully defined. So now you go and you hand it off to your contract manufacturer. Well, that contract manufacturer doesn't know how to do it. And next thing you know, you end up with challenges in the transfer and, mm -hmm. and, and it could end up with problems in your builds. It could end up with additional costs because of mm -hmm. NRE, because they have to do extra engineering work or it ends up in bad product being produced mm -hmm. because they, they're not building it to, to meet certain requirements that aren't defined. And so, you know, in the long run, it increases your transfer cycles and, the worst part is it increased your cost of the transfer. And so, you know, of course, the finance guys don't like that. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting to me. because I know, like, within the process development uh, uh, step, it's very iterative as you go through that. Yes. But the five steps, are there actual check gates then between each step? You do this and then you that gets signed off and we proceed because there's not iteration, obviously, between the steps. There, there, there is. And, and so typically what, what I like to do is um, I'm also a, a project manager. Okay. So, so we have a project management process, a methodology kind of follows the pen book, if you're familiar with that. Um, and, and over the years, I've developed a template of 
of all the tasks that are required to actually do a design transfer. And again, iterated that template with each, mm -hmm. each transfer because there's always something that's missing. There's always something that you do a little bit different that you find out is better. And so the five steps are really, if you want to think about it in a project management perspective, are the top five work streams. And then those waterfall down into sub work streams. Mm -hmm. and, and like the great example you gave was the iterative process and process development. So we like to use the APQP process, uh, which came from the auto industry. So one of it is you develop your, your process flow diagram, and then you, you, you uh, which is based on your very initial time where you're trying to put this together. And then you, you do a process FMA off of that to identify all the issues that can go wrong in your process that could impact your product or the next steps in the process. And then you go back and you iterate your process again to mitigate those, whether it's, it's adding mistake proofing mm -hmm. or it's, it's um, custom fixturing or whatever you would need to do to do that. And so the, the schedule that we build actually has those iterative processes in there. And so one of the challenges with that is um, there's always time to market, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge. So many times you end up with a customer that comes to you and says, I need this built by next week. Yeah. And it's, if they want it built right, and they want a product that's compliant to medical device regulations or to medical device directives, if it's the EU or if they go to JPAL in Japan, you can't do that. You have to develop your processes. You have to validate your processes and make sure they work right. And it's, 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 a, pro it's, it's a process that's long and it's painful at times too. And, and a lot of the medical device companies, especially the startups, don't understand that yet because they've never experienced it yet. So that expectation of here, I'm going to hand you this, you give me your, my unit next week is, is very difficult and not realistic. So it's getting people to understand that is, is, is difficult. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's good explanation. Let me, let me follow up though on the, um, going back to the, uh, to the requirements definition, yeah. how does microboard as a contract manufacturer then help customers with this kind of foundational step? Okay. So you know, we have a, a very strong medical device team here at Microboard. Um, other than myself, with the 34 plus years of experience in medical device, our vi vice president of operations also has over 30 plus years. And we have two quality and regulatory um, engineers with 30 plus years of medical device experience. Um, this allows us to really understand processes and products. And when we have our first interactions with the customer. We're in that first work stream, which is the requirement stage. We really dig into the requirements. We actually try to understand the design, mm -hmm. soup to nuts, the electrical design, the mechanical design, the software design. And we try to identify gaps, things that we think are missing. And then we work with the customer and we try to understand the, if there is truly a gap there and if there is, how can we help them? Because we're multidisciplined, um, we don't just identify the gaps. You know, the easiest thing is, hey, this doesn't tell me everything I need to do. Go, go take it, right? That's the easy thing. And that's what most companies do. Because we have the most multidiscipline uh, uh, resources and the experience, we can actually help identify the gaps. And if it's an electrical design gap, we can actually help the, the, the customer fix their electrical design. Same thing with software. Same thing with mechanical and especially with the regulatory compliance side with, with the two, two uh, resources that we have that have both of them have over 30 years of experience in a regulatory world as medical device quality regulatory managers. Mm -hmm. So that, that's pretty much how we, we, we would approach that and help get the, get the customer's requirements defined properly so that we're both on the same page. Okay, good. So going beyond the, the properly defining the requirements up front, where do you see the medical device manufacturers kind of get into trouble when they're outsourcing to a contract manufacturer? Well, the, the, the easiest situation that they, they get into trouble is they select the wrong contract manufacturer for the <laughs> wrong reason. And I have experience with this too, especially because I come from a, you know, the thousand pound gorilla corporation wow. that, that, uh, that has, you know, different functional groups that do certain things. Um, so one of the biggest problems that I see is, is, is a, a medical device manufacturer will actually select a contract manufacturer for financial reasons, not with the long-term uh, understanding or goal of having a really good partnership with that contract manufacturer and making sure that that contract manufacturer can actually meet their requirements. 
-hmm. you know, and that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, it's, it, you know, it, it's really important for, for a medical device manufacturer to have a, a cross-functional team that's involved in the selection process. This way you're covering all your bases. You're not just looking at finances. You've got, if there's electrical design work, you've got electrical engineers involved. You've got software engineers. You got your quality engineers for the validation and the, and the compliance side. You want to, you know, you want to make sure the contract manufacturer has a really good um, quality system that's medical device compliant and that they actually meet that system because that's a different thing too. There's been a lot of cases where I've gone to places where I've looked at their quality system and on paper, it's great. And then when you go and you actually do your audit and you go through the, the facility and you're like, well, doesn't your procedure tell you to do X, Y, Z? Oh yeah, it does. Um, that person's not here today. So that's why you don't see it. And you know, so you, 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 it's really important to really dig in and do that. And so mm -hmm. making sure you're selecting the contract manufacturer for the right reason is very, very important. And, you know, I have experience with this too. Um, you know, again, like I said, in my previous experience, we had a, a, a global functional group select a contract manufacturer for the entire organization that every facility had to go through. And that that contract manufacturer had no experience in actual mm -hmm. device manufacturing. They were a medical device manufacturer, but when I'm talking devices, I'm talking like an electrical mechanical device mm -hmm. that, that we produced in our facility. They were more of a consumables manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And so we had to go to the supplier with one of our products. And you know, it wasn't full turnkey. I couldn't get, go through the requirements with them and hand them over and just monitor and, 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 and evaluate their their process development cycles. I actually had to be on site. I think I spent 15 weeks out of, out of, a, a, out of a five month period there and where I actually was training them on medical device manufacturing. I was helping them develop procedures and templates, process validation, myself and my quality engineer that was with me, we wrote all their process validation documentation. We actually executed their validation and trained them. So it was great for the contract manufacturer. They had free training, but for our organization, it was terrible because there were other more <laughs> critical to the business needs that myself and our quality engineer needed to work on that we couldn't work on because we had to make this, this successful. So again, it's where it's really critical. You make sure you select a supplier for the right reason yeah. and they actually yeah. meet your needs. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. I'm in previous career when I was a consultant in the industry, I talked to a lot of startups and you, you know, they they're all excited about their product. And you say, well, how are you gonna have it manufactured? Yeah, and they say, Oh, it's gonna go to XYZ. Why them? Yeah. Oh, somebody on our board has a relationship with them, right? So yeah, it's like, exactly, exactly. Hmm, maybe yeah. not the best way to select. So tell me how I call it the steak dinner selection. <laughs> yeah. If you exactly. get a really good steak dinner, yeah. <laughs> they're the supplier. Yeah, you're being sold. Yep. Um, so how does Microboard then help customers avoid these risks? Well, there's there's two two areas there. Um, one is the strength of our medical device team. Um, you know, with our experience, our understanding of, of the work that needs to get done and how it gets done, you know, we, we can actually do a full turnkey transition and actually lead the, the medical device manufacturer along the path on how to actually do a design transfer properly. Mm -hmm. That's especially helpful if it's a it's, if it's a startup or a smaller company that doesn't have the infrastructure in their in their facility to actually manage that. We we can provide that service uh, that that, um, that service. Um, and the second is this just a five step approach and utilizing the project management practices. You know I mentioned it earlier that that there's a template that I've used forever mm -hmm. and refined it. And it not only takes the five steps, but it waterfalls it down into other work streams and, and defines everything that needs to be done. And, and that template is soup to nuts. It's everything that you could possibly do in a design transfer. And what, what I do is I actually customize it for each project because each project is gonna be different. Some projects may need automation of, of assembly. Some projects need automation of tests. Some projects need assembly fixes, some projects don't. So you, you customize it and you work with the customer to, to go through their product and, and identify everything that needs to be done and you follow that structure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it helps a lot because then you can take that, that, that project management practice and that template and essentially the project schedule that you end up building at the end. And now you can communicate consistently with the customer and they know exactly where you are at all times. 
they know what issues you're having. And it's really, it's really project management reporting. So it's, it's that whole, whole um, cycle. Yeah. You know, just a follow up question on that, you know, um, do you give any consideration in that transfer to the, to the equipment set being used? And, and I'll tell you the reason I asked, I used to, I used to manage a quick turn prototype shop, right? And so we would do quick turn. We use Juki machines. That's just yeah. what we had. But then we're going to transfer into an environment that may be using my day or whatever, right? And you know, I, we always conceived of it as you know, same recipe, different kitchen, right? What's the yeah. equipment set, and how would that impact it? So, do you give any? Is there any consideration to that in this process? Yeah, there has to be, especially with with, with the validation approach. So, so if you're you're familiar with the Juki type of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, on our surface mount lines, we have Fuji lines. We actually have three lines and they run for roughly two shifts. The two shifts aren't running 100% of the time on all three lines. So we actually try to do any type of prototyping or anything on one particular line just so that it's not impacting production. Right. But when you're, in, when you're talking about a medical device, you know you can't just take that unit that's over here that you set up a process on and move it to a completely different line because that line has its own tolerances. Yeah. And because each machine in that line has its own tolerances, you're going to have tolerance stackups that could actually impact you. Yeah. And so what you have to do is you come through and if you switch a line, say you have a prototype line and then you go to production, mm -hmm. you essentially have to redo your entire validation. And what I would typically do in my experience in that is I would actually do prototype builds or another pilot build on that line, identify any gaps and then mm -hmm. do the validation because then you can iterate your process again and with any tweaks that you have to do for that specific line. Mm -hmm. You know, in the ideal world, everything works the same. If you talk to the supplier that you buy equipment from, no, just the repeatability and reproducibility of this product is great. You'll never have any issues from one-to-one. -one. And then, you know, that's, that's never happens, you know? <laughs> no, good. So what advice would you have for, for medical device manufacturers who are outsourcing their electronic manufacturing maybe for the first time and or maybe experiencing less than ideal results yeah that, that's that's a really good question um it, again it comes back to i think and, and i harp on this a lot i even harp on this internally here with some people i drive them nuts it, it's the requirements you know if, if you don't understand what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it how are you going to make it right so so the first thing is is look internally make do the best you can to get your requirements right so that mm -hmm. whether you you know it's it's requirements on a drawing whether you're, you're putting dimensions and tolerances or it's 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 software functionality where you know you're you're looking for test engineering you're going to say hey i need you send this command you should get this back with this stimulus you know whatever it is make sure your requirements are really robust and then then when you start interacting with the contract manufacturer you're going to get some discussion back and forth to really make sure that they understand the requirements. That's key. Um, and then the other thing is when you're looking for a contract manufacturer, you really got to make sure that they have the right staff, right? If they don't have the right staff, they can have great engineers. They can have great software engineers. They can have a great sales team or whatever. But if they don't have the right staff with a medical device background, you're already mm -hmm. starting in the hole because now they have to learn. Yeah. And, and if you're a new startup, then you have to learn too. So then you run into that situation where if both sides are learning, who's teaching who <laughs> and are you learning properly? And, and I have a great example with that. We have a, we have a contract manufacturer and I'm, I'm putting together a manufacturing cell right now for them. And, and they're a mature medical device manufacturer, but they're, they're a smaller organization. And, you know, I started looking at stuff and started asking them questions and you get the, you can see the deer in the headlights kind of thing. Like, Oh, we never thought of that. Oh, we never thought of that. And so that's where the requirements is really, really important because without good requirements, you're not getting what you want. And if you're not working with a contract manufacturer that has that skill set and their resources, then they're not going to ask the right questions. Now, in the end, you may think you got something good and it may work perfectly fine. And again, in the medical device world, it depends on your classification. If you're making class one devices, you're not going to hurt anybody unless somebody throws it out their head and they knock them out or something, you know. <laughs> but if you're in a class three device or an implantable device, you mm -hmm. want to make sure you're selecting the right supplier that's going to help you make a product that's always going to work. And you don't have to worry about latent failures or anything like that, because the last thing you want is the FDA showing up with a descent decree because you have a recall or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Good. To, so thank you for this. I'd like to end by asking you if so, we're going to broadcast this. People might be interested in the white paper. How do they get a hold of it? Sure. The white paper is actually on, on, on the microboard website. It's www.microboard.com. And they'll be able to find find it hopefully easily there. I haven't been to the website in a while, but uh, I'll make sure that the team has it in a spot that's easy to find. Um, and then you can download the white paper. And like I said in the very beginning, you know, the white paper is there to share share our experiences and help educate people in some key parameters. And if it if the white paper leads to them contacting us at Microboard and and just having discussions with us, great, great for both of us. If it doesn't, but it helps them make a better selection on the contract manufacturer they're working for and ultimately get them a better product, that's great too. That's you know, it's all about sharing the knowledge. Yeah. You know, uh, one thing that's always impressed me about Microboard, and I think it's your CEO, Nicole Russo, kind of articulates it, saying that you're data-driven, transparent, and collaborative. And I think those three principles, and I think that kind of comes through in what we're in my discussion with you here today too, is, you know, we can help you, but if it helps you go somewhere else and build a good product, that's, that's excellent. Okay, that's, yeah. Too. Yeah. that's excellent. Mike, this has been terrific. This is, I would tell people if they wanted to get a hold of you, go to LinkedIn, but like I discovered, you, you, you don't have a presence there. So yeah, uh, the social media side, I'm not really there yet. I keep telling everybody I'm going to do it. One of these days, I'm going to shock everybody. <laughs> yeah. So what I would say is anybody, if they reach out to uh, to Microboard, if you're interested, if you want to try to get a hold of Mike, uh, reach out to me and I'll, I'll do my best to put you in contact with him as well. Absolutely. So, Appreciate that, Eric. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Mike, this has been terrific. Thank you very much, sir. This was excellent. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.